we're not asking for a great amount of water more. We're just asking for an equal share of water. We took out the Corps engineer to show them what we're going through, the lack, what, what's happening with the lack of fresh water. I was shocked to find out was that if you look at the first nine months of 2012, and you compare it to the first nine months of every other year since 1923 when we first started collecting records on this river, we're on track now to be the lowest year ever. Uh, we've tried to get the Corps of Engineers to consider uh, reconsidering their operations and they just say, you know, we've set the operations, that's what we're doing, we're sticking to it. And Congress provides the authorization that tells us how to operate the projects and, and how, to, how to release the water and we, and we, use, uh, we use that process and, and that's what we follow. Corps controls the flow of water in the Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, Flint Basin. And the Apalachicola is at the end of the line. I guess what it is right now. Shannon lets the colonel feel the bottom of the bay for himself. He might be an old There's one, two on that old. That old's right there. If we get the right conditions, now right now they're growing slowly. We're not getting any fresh water to get the nutrients. Right. And to get the nutrients, we got to get some fresh water in the backlands, in the swamp, and then it drains out. Right. But that old's right there, and between a eight to a year, it could be three inches. Oh, okay. You know, in a year's time, that could be a, that'd be a legal size old. The nutrients in the bay are so depleted from the low water, not bringing those nutrients down, that the entire bay is in a, a depressed, very depressed situation. And really the only thing that's gonna really help bring it back is a more fresh water. When I'm paddling, it doesn't feel like a river in peril, but if it weren't, you wouldn't be here. This is River Trek, a fundraiser for the Apalachicola Riverkeeper. Eleven paddlers are traveling the length of the river to raise funds and awareness for a river system that's getting much less water than it needs. I hear a crackle. Yeah, it's crackles good. This is a good one here. Estefan Olga, across from where we wake up on day three, is the last of the taller bluffs along the river. These bluffs are indicative of the geology of the of this area, and as you can see, it's it's just about straight up and down, and it just keeps keeps going from there. It's over the ore here, so uh, really important fish habitat. These structures were built to straighten the river channel and to make the river faster for barge traffic. That faster water leads to the erosion of bluffs along the river. Of course, there aren't many barges passing this way now. I have to say the first time we paddled the Apalachicola, it was really special. We did a 50 mile stretch and I immediately fell in love. It's just, it's a beautiful place, really nice and uh, so much more remote feeling than you would think a river with such an incredible history to the state of Florida. It's very big. It's very wide. It's uh, very pretty, beautiful, um, quiet, slow. So I think you might kind of you might apply the uh, term majestic to it in a lot of ways. Ignoring the ecological damage, the dredging done by the Army Corps in years past has created some recreationally favorable features, like the many wide sandbars we camp and rest on. And then there's Sand Mountain. This is Sand Mountain. It's at least, um, I'd say, four or five stories tall. It was created by dredging, spoiling, dredging the river over several years. And this is the highest spoil uh, mound on the river. Most of the other ones are sandbars. The more you paddle, the more you see signs of low water flow. There are things you wouldn't even know you were missing. Adventures not taken. This canopied creek off of Owl Creek reaches a quick dead end, but we could explore it for some time if the water were higher. Less water is making its way down creeks and sloughs, and to the life that depends on it. 
The more you paddle, the more you see how people rely on the river. It's their home, their playground. Fish hooks hang from trees. Hunting dogs bark from floating kennels. It is still a vital river system. It can still offer the simple pleasure of paddling between cypress trees on the way to our campground. You can handle the food. <laughs> That's not really a sports car. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a couple spots going down that might be a little confusing where you got major branches of rivers forking off. So you need to stay with somebody with a map, not go too fast. And we need to gather up at the end, right after the railroad bridge. There's a railroad bridge, you can't miss that. About three miles before the end. <clears throat> On the right, there's kind of a sand beach. Let's gather up there, make sure we're all together. We want to come into town um, together as a group, and then if anybody really wants to race and touch the bridge, that would be the appropriate time. I tried to keep up. Old age prevails here. I beat the much younger, much stronger guys, huh? So at some point, just pure grit and determination pays off. <laughs> just like that, river trek is over. I have a lot to process from these five days. Preserving this river is so important for so many reasons and so many people. Historically, the river flow has been probably two to three times more than it currently is. You know, this is Mother Nature and it's worse. Uh, we we faced hurricanes. The crisis situation. I'm afraid you won't be around for It's a battle. I'm here. We're gonna lose. WFSU, I'm Rob Diaz de Villegas.